Welcome to Playing Above the Line, where we interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and community activists to get their thoughts and perspectives on leadership. Playing Above the Line is sponsored by Aviso Group, a business consulting and accounting firm focused on preparing clients for the future through innovation and positive growth. Welcome to Playing Above the Line. I'm Alan, your host. I've got a great episode for you today. We're excited to have Alex Peichel in with us, and Alex is the owner of Kind Cafe here in Fairhope, Alabama. So, Alex, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Alan. War Eagle. War Eagle. I'm wearing my Auburn gear. We've got a big bowl game. Well, it's not a big bowl game, Kerry. We've, we're talking about this off mic. It's a small, <laughs> insignificant bowl game, but I'm glad to know that Alex is a, an Auburn fan, so I, I like him even more. So, the Kind Cafe. Alex, tell us what it is, a little background about how you came about starting this business. Yeah, absolutely. So, at our core, we're just a bagel and coffee shop here in Fairhope, Alabama, one of the first bagel shops here along the Gulf Coast, okay. other than Pensacola and Ocean Springs, Mississippi. Okay. And so, you know, really we're a mission-based cafe, though, in inspiring kindness in our community. And really for us, that starts with our employees and the employee experience. If you think about hospitality, it typically hasn't been a great place to work. And so, right. you know, we're really betting on focusing a lot of on our employees. They're going to spread that kindness to the customers and then in turn into the community with some of the nonprofits that we work with. Okay, good. So why don't you guys open? How long have you been open? Yeah, so we opened November 10th of 2021. Okay. Started working on the idea September of 2020. And so with COVID, definitely ran into some hurdles with construction and getting things going, but better late than never. Yeah, right. So September 2020, we were in the middle of a pandemic, and I guess we kind of still are in 2022. But talk about how that experience kind of shaped your vision for what you wanted Kind Cafe to be? I mean, did you have this, this, I guess, notion that you wanted to make a social statement, I guess, with the way the cafe is run and how you treat your employees and whatnot before that? Or did the pandemic just kind of magnify that need in your, in your mind? Yeah, great question. I think the pandemic definitely spurred some of that. And so, you know, I'm from this area, I grew up on what I call the bad side of Fish River, but I went through the Somerdale <laughs> Foley, you know, yeah. school system, but lived out in Dallas the last four years. I have a corporate software sales and marketing background, worked okay. for SAP and some of these large SaaS companies. And so the pandemic was definitely a little tougher in Dallas because they're much stricter on mask and social distancing. And so I was working from home, but I would spend a lot of days in coffee shops and bagel shops there and other places to go to lunch. I began to notice that we were almost becoming very robotic. Mm -hmm. There wasn't really any human connection anymore because we're trying to keep people away from us. We can't see their smiles. We're not making eye contact. And so I felt like that was really tough on a lot of people in a lot of the community. And so just began to spur ideas around, you know, is there something that I can build to help connect humans again. Because, mm -hmm. you know, honestly, when you go about your day to day and you meet someone, you never really know what's going on in their life in that moment. Right. You know, their grandfather could have just died. They could have lost their job just now, or their company could be about to declare bankruptcy. And so really this, it's this idea that you could potentially change the trajectory of someone's day just by treating them with kindness, just by practicing empathy and really, for us, being a quick service breakfast spot, that starts in the morning mm -hmm. for those customers that come in. And that extra smile and that extra hello asking about their kids could make their morning. Yeah. So talk about the setup. So is there space to stay and eat and have your coffee, or is it strictly a pick-up-and-go type yeah. situation? So we have about probably 22 seats inside. And then, I mean, if you count the shared outside courtyard and the couple tables mm -hmm. we have on our private dining area, probably have another about 10, 15 seats. And okay. so there's definitely room for in-house dining. I think where we're taking the business is we definitely want to serve the community and our customers more in the quick service fashion. If you think about a lot in the Fairhope area, if you're a nurse on the way to Thomas Hospital, you don't necessarily have time to go in and wait 10 or 15 minutes to get your coffee or right. get your breakfast. You may not have time to go wait in the McDonald's drive through It's not a great breakfast anyways. And so we're trying to do a lot with curbside online ordering mm. and things like that to serve our customers in a quick yeah. fashion and planning actually on launching delivery here in January. So okay. let's stay tuned for that as well. All right. Well, one of my favorite things to do, and I don't get to do it much at all really, is to go into a good coffee shop and sit down and have a cup of coffee or a cappuccino and, and a bagel or whatever. And I'm a big atmosphere kind of right. guy, right? So what do you think is the most important thing about the atmosphere in a coffee shop and specifically kind cafe i mean what do you hope that folks kind of feel when they walk in and sit down 
Yeah, I think the most important thing is it's just inclusive and it's inviting. Yeah. I love coffee shops. That's probably what I'm most passionate about, at least from a product perspective. I love mm-hmm. coffee, but you go in a lot of coffee shops, they can kind of be intimidating. If you think about the third wave of coffee and different espresso drinks and the feel of the place, it's very coffee culture. And so we wanted to kind of steer away from that because we wanted a more inviting, happy, and inclusive place. And so my business partner did a great job of this with the design and the look of the building. But when you come in, it's very bright, very colorful. You get those happy vibes. Mm-hmm. You're glad to be there. You may strike up a conversation with someone sitting next to you because the tables are very close together. And so just a really welcoming and community-driven environment. Gotcha. Well, you said something when we first started recording, and you also on your show primer, you mentioned the fact that customers can't come first if you don't have employees that are there to willingly serve yeah. them. And so you kind of turn that on its head a little bit, because I think a lot of time the people in the hospitality industry think, rightly so, that the customer is key. It's very important. But what you're saying is you can never give that customer the full experience without your employees being happy and content and feeling valued and taken care of. So talk about How did that mindset kind of develop and and just expand on that a little bit, if you don't mind? Yeah. I mean, the old adage is customers are always right. Customers come first and customers matter a lot, right? You know, they pay our bills, we them to come in and buy the product. But if I don't have good employees, the customers are never going to have a great experience. I'm in the people business is Mm -hmm. really what I'm in. And the employees in this type of retail environment, they're the face of our business. Mm -hmm. And so it really just made me think about from my own experience growing up working in restaurants that they should really be the focus because the customers are going to miss out on that experience with your business if they're not necessarily in the right place. Well, so talk about your team then. I would imagine that finding good people to work for you is tough in the best of times, but I mean, in a pandemic, when we have the government assistance and whatnot out there that's kind of keeping the job market from being real flush with, with people. So talk about trying to find people to be on your team? And then what are you looking for when you're looking for somebody to come in and be part of what you've got at Kind Cafe there? Yeah, I think I'll probably start with the second half of that question and what we're looking for. We're looking for driven people that are accountable, but they're also just very happy and professional and enjoy being around other people. We're really hiring for a culture fit, not necessarily experience. Mm -hmm. If I'm not there all the time and my business partner, Megan's not there all the time either, it's very much a team environment. Do you play well with others? And so that's what we're looking for. To go back to the first part of your question, I think for every business out there, hiring's definitely been a problem. But really the way we approached it is it's been going on long enough now, two years, right? And you talk about like an employee shortage in hospitality. Well, after two years, is it really a problem still if you're not willing to change your hiring practices, Mm -hmm. if you're not willing to change the culture, if you're not willing to change the environment? And so that's really how we approached it with hospitality. Traditionally, very tough place to work, tough culture. You go in the kitchen, there may be a lot of harassment. There's not a lot of transparency in your pay. You don't know what you're getting paid. You don't really know what you're getting tipped. Mm -hmm. And so we built a lot of that into our own hiring practices into the employee experience. And so honestly, we haven't ran into that as a problem. We've got 13 people on our staff right now. We probably turned away about 10 out of all the applicants. And then we're still kind of overstaffed now, trying to fill in everybody's hours and everything else. But I think some of that is the brand that we built and being involved in the community. Employees at that age want to be a part of restaurants with a purpose. But I think the other part of that is that employee experience and how much we focused on that. Yeah. Something really simple that we do it doesn't cost us any more, but we pay everybody weekly. You think about like the traditional restaurant employee, they need their cash now. Mm-hmm. High schoolers, college kids, their tire may blow out. They need their cash now. So as a business, because it doesn't cost me any more, I do direct deposit. There's no reason for me to wait every two weeks to pay them. We've got really good feedback from our employees that we just pay them weekly and their funds are more readily available. I think something else super simple that we've done that would be easy for a lot of businesses to do is we just do monthly one-on-ones. And it's nice for them to hear feedback and then we also get feedback from them. Your employees see a lot of different areas of the business that you may not be able to see. And so some of the cool things and the cool innovations with our products that we have coming down the road is really like information that we've got from our employees in those one-on-ones. I would think that you're probably one of the few 
restaurants slash coffee shops that has sit down wood on ones with their employees, I would think. I just don't think yeah. that's the thing in the hospitality industry, really. No, you it's know? not. Yeah. And then a big part of that is practicing that transparency, too. Yeah. And a lot of that transparency comes in those one-on-ones and those feedbacks. Right. Here's where you're doing really well. Here's where you need to improve. And most of your employees, if you're hiring the right people, they're really good people. They're trying to improve. They want a good job. They just need to hear that as well. Yeah, that's great. So you mentioned earlier that you guys are community-minded and, and you have nonprofits that you work with. So would you like to expand on who those guys are and, and what exactly you do with them? Yeah, so there's really three main nonprofits that we work with now, potentially looking to add more in the future as we expand. And so those three that we work with right now are the Exceptional Foundation, Flourish, and then the Baldwin Humane Society. Okay. You know, honestly, when we were building this business, we realized that just as a human being, we feel a lot better giving back to other people, volunteering. And so we really tried to take that approach with, well, there's a lot of great nonprofits out there that don't get very much awareness. How can we help raise awareness in the cafe, put them front of mind, work with them? We also pay our employees to volunteer with them and things like that as well, just as another employee incentive. And so one of the easiest ways that we were able to do that is a lot of these nonprofits have annual fundraisers Mm -hmm. where they sell specific products at one time of year. And that's where a lot of their funds come from. And so what my business partner, Megan did, which was a great idea, she established a nonprofit table in our cafe. So we have our cafe merchandise on the shelf, but then those three nonprofits that we're working with, that gives them the ability not only to raise awareness, but they're selling those products to where they can raise funds throughout the year. And so we'll buy those from them, sell them for what their cost was, and then donate that money back to them. Oh, that's great. So describe your leadership style. How do you see yourself as a leader as far as your qualities and kind of the way that you approach that aspect of what you have to do every day? Well, I think honestly, I'm still figuring that out. I I haven't quite arrived with my own expectations on who I should be as a leader and if I'm doing the right things. What I think about is I want to lead from the front. You know, I think about like servant leadership. If I'm there during the day and I can work with my employees, I want to be the one that's taking out the trash or I want to be the one doing the dishes. You think about all those things that no employee necessarily wants to do, kind of the grunt work. I try to lead from the front and being the person that does that. I think the other part when it comes to leadership that I really try to take to heart is the buck stops with me. And so if something goes wrong in the cafe, it's not my employee's fault. It's not my kitchen manager's fault. It's not my business partner's fault, Megan. It's not my general manager's fault. It was my fault. I missed something and not training them correctly. And so if you're able to continue to have those employees and things are happening, it's not their fault. As the leader, that's my fault. And I need to figure out how to fix that. Yeah, that's great. Well, so speaking of the book Stop Seer Guy, which you are, you're making decisions every every day. So talk about having to make those tough decisions and, and maybe an example or some of the decisions that you've had to make that aren't really easy or not even popular maybe with your employees. Talk about that. Being a new business owner, that's something else I'm still figuring out as well because those decisions really matter. Those are yeah. Those are real decisions that can affect the next month, can affect the next several years. And so I really try to approach it in two different ways with my background I have a finance degree from Auburn. So, you know, I try to let data drive a lot of my decisions. Mm -hmm. And so I'll take some of that information, whatever decision I'm trying to figure out, what is the data telling me? What is the financial statement telling me? If I'm overstaffed, what is my labor percentage of net sales? The other thing that I take into consideration with that, though, that's very important, and I think this may be where I struggle sometimes, is also try to think with the heart and what are the people telling me? Because it is a people business. And then figuring out how to balance the data between the people. A good example would be maybe we're a little bit slower on Monday morning, but I had three employees come in. And so I'm looking at my labor percentage of net sales, and it's it's over my benchmark for that morning. But some of my employees may drive from Foley and may drive from Silver Hill, or is it fair for me to send them home for that day? Because in the long term, like grand scheme of things, is that extra 5% on my labor percentage of net sales going to really matter if I take into consideration employee morale, them being upset that they got sent home early and drove long, only made a couple dollars an hour, whatever that was. 
Yeah, we're human, right? And so yeah. if your employees are having those thoughts, that would probably carry over into the experience the customer has, exactly. which is what we just talked about, you know, yeah. five minutes ago. So, yeah, that's great. Talk about influences. You mentioned your parents. Obviously, a lot of folks would say that their parents, big influences on their lives. Talk about them than anybody else that might have been an influence or a mentor yeah. to you. My parents have been a great influence on me, if I had to guess. A lot of people in my situation have had a great influence from their parents, you know, just very understanding ask the right questions. And I think more than anything, they're extremely supportive. If you think about when you're starting a a business from a concept, you're going to ultimately encounter a lot of naysayers, people that tell you you can't. My parents did a really good job of just being supportive and helping me see through my dreams. But a specific mentor and influence that comes to mind is really like my first boss coming out of Auburn. So I went into software sales pretty much immediately. Decided I didn't want to necessarily be in a desk job, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it just wasn't for me. Mm-hmm. So I went to work for Reynolds and Reynolds, which is a computer software company for car dealerships. My territory was the Gulf Coast. So I managed accounts from Ocean Springs, Mississippi to Panama City Beach. Yeah. And my first boss was Rudy Nieto. And so what I really learned from him is yes, you can be somebody's boss and help manage their day to day, but you can also be their friend and personally care for them. Yeah. And that goes a long way with your employees when you get to learn about somebody's family and you get to learn about the things that they enjoy to do. And you can have that relationship that's both professional and personal. And then I think I go back to, you know, when I was talking about trying to lead from the front, a lot of that's what I really learned from him as well, that being the boss and being the leader, you need to be the hardest work in the room. And ultimately the buck stops with you. So if I messed up on a proposal that I'm presenting to a dealership, Rudy didn't necessarily take the approach, Alex, why did you do that? You messed up. It was more, well, that was my fault. I didn't properly train you or show you how to do this. Let's figure out how we can fix it in the future so we don't have to have these conversations. Yeah. You mentioned relationship, and that's a word that's come up over and over the past three years on the podcast. And and I've said multiple times, and I think what you're saying kind of bears that out. But if you get the relationship part right, most everything else will take care of itself. I mean, you still have to perform. You still have to, you know, provide a good product. And that goes to the customer as well as the employee. I and mean, it sounds like you've borne that out in the way that you've decided to run your business and lead your employees. That's great. What's the favorite thing that you do every day? Anything, what what yeah, just gets yeah. you fired up? Yeah, I want to know uh, what I mean, honestly, fired up. what I've really – so what gets me fired up, probably a different question. But, I mean, honestly, what I've really enjoyed about owning the cafe and being in there a lot during the day-to-day is just getting to know – my employees, but also kind of the regulars. I think we've honestly been really blessed in this first two months. The community was extremely welcoming. I mean, we have people that come in three or four times a week now. Mm-hmm. And because of that, I've kind of got to know their kids or whether they're Georgia fans and they're traveling to go to the national championship in a couple of weeks and things like that. And so, again, going back to relationships, even even though I'm across the counter from them and serving them and the meeting a lot of times is very brief, but mm-hmm. you're, you know, you're still getting to forge some of these personal relationships. Yeah. It's been really cool. All right. So what gets you fired up in? You said that's a different question. Just by nature, I'm a very impatient person. And so it's more of a me problem <laughs> than it is like other problems. And so with the business, I know we have to move extremely fast and we mm-hmm. have to move faster than the market. Consumer perceptions are changing quickly. The market's changing quickly. Competition is moving really mm-hmm. quickly. And so I definitely get fired up sometimes when I feel like we're not moving fast enough when we're not getting things done fast enough. We haven't implemented this product quick enough or this new bagel, whatever it is. And so a lot of times I've got to take a step back and really evaluate who they are. Are they moving as fast as they can? Because it's not fair for me to expect because I move really fast and I want to move fast that everybody can do that. And so I would say that definitely fires me up but it's not necessarily a fair thing to be fired up about understood understood so what's the best piece of advice that you've gotten from either your mom or dad or from that first mentor from anybody really and it doesn't have to be necessarily tied to your opening of kind cafe it could be but what's the best piece of advice that somebody's given you honestly it's it's both advice i've got from my parents it's advice that i've got from rudy some of my first mentors you know having a sales background you have a lot of ups and downs. You're going to have quarters where you blow out your quota and then next quarter, somebody's going to tell you no. Mm -hmm. I've really seen that in the business. We have really good days and things are going great. And then sometimes things happen. It's really easy to get very high and very low, but as a person, that's really tough to manage. You're going to burn out quickly when you're letting yourself 
get that high and get that low, get really down about something. And so I don't think I'm great at it. I'm working on it, but just trying to be even kill, Mm -hmm. you know, not Mm -hmm. get too high, not get too excited, realize that there's another day in front of us. And then when things happen, things happen, try not to get too low and too down about it and still be optimistic. And so you can relate that to a lot of your life though, too. Yeah, that's great advice. How far do you look at as far as planning for what you want to do at the cafe? Do you look one, two, three, five years out? What is your what is your vision for what you want the cafe to become? Yeah, I really look out to, I don't see myself ever retiring, but I do see potentially an end. So I look out as far as if I was ever going to step away from the cafe, where would the cafe be? Mm-hmm. And so then I even try to break that down into what does that mean in 10 years? What does that mean in five years? What does that even mean for the next couple months and year? And we are looking to grow pretty aggressively. And so yeah. my initial five-year goal is to open up a cafe every year okay. to kind of get us to five. That next benchmark would be 10. Probably at that point, I'm going to have some outside shareholders and they're going to be wanting to grow it. And they're going to be like, Alex, you're not skilled enough to run this business anymore. We need you to step aside. And so that's kind of the future, but definitely growth and focusing on the Gulf Coast, focusing on small communities that we can be involved in. That's really where the next five to 10 years is going to be focused on. Okay, that's great. Where are you located in Fairhope? So we're uh, located at Section Place. If you know where the City Hall is and the Police Department is, it's that okay. development right across the street. It's where Section Street Pizza, Cactus Cantina, and the yard is, in okay. that shared courtyard. All right, very good. And we will link your social media and, and, and website and everything related to Kind Cafe in the show notes. But Alex, thank you very much. This has been great. Yeah, thank you, Alan. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and Spotify. It definitely helps us in the ratings, and it also makes it easier for other folks to find the podcast. And as always, a big thank you to producer and editor, Carrie Wolf. Playing Above the Line is sponsored by Aviso Group. If you want to know more about who we are and what we do, you can visit our website at avisogroup.com. That's A-V-I-Z-O group.com. You can also check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Thanks for listening.